Hi, my name is June Um. I'm one of the neuro-oncologist specialists here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and I'm part of a very large team of physicians, surgeons, and scientists who are all dedicated to taking the best care possible of brain tumor patients. With any disease that affects the brain, whether it's a tumor or stroke or anything else, the symptoms really depend upon where in the brain the tumor is located. Uh, there are certain regions in the brain where a tumor can grow quite large because it's not serving a function that you would notice on a day-to-day -day basis. So it might take a while before you start to notice personality changes, maybe some lapses in memory. In contrast, if you have a tumor that's affecting an area of the brain that controls strength or coordination, then you would notice that immediately, of course. So how a patient comes to medical attention largely depends upon one, where is the tumor, but also two, how large is that tumor, and last but not least, how fast or slowly did it grow to be that size. Well, in terms of diagnosis, that can sometimes be a challenge. When you go to your family doctor or your general doctor, you might just be presenting with headaches. And it's very rare that a person coming with mild symptoms like that has a brain tumor. But it's when the symptoms are relentless, a person often will get a scan done. And a lot of our diagnosis is based upon how the tumor or the mass looks on the MRI or CT. And we have a pretty good idea just by looking at those initial pictures as to what the tumor is going to turn out to be. Now, once a scan is done, we almost always have to get at least a piece of that tumor to look at under the microscope. In an ideal situation, we'd like to take out as much of the tumor as possible by way of surgery, but if the tumor is located in a very difficult to access location, we would actually do a biopsy instead. The uh, treatment for patients with brain tumors really does require a team effort. You know, first and foremost, we really count on neurosurgery colleagues to do the operation, get the biopsy, uh, because this is the first and most important step in not only achieving the diagnosis, but if the patient is having tremendous symptoms, we can actually decompress the brain. Uh, then once the patient is recuperated, the treatments fall into two categories. One is radiation-based, and the other is chemotherapy-based, and very often we'll actually use the two in combination if one helps the other do its job better. Now, which treatment we choose for an individual patient would depend upon their diagnosis, but also is this their new diagnosis or is this a tumor that they have had before that's grown back despite frontline treatment. Uh, for a new diagnosis patient, we would almost always use radiation, often combined with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, these tumors often tend to come back, so we have many clinical trials as well as non-trial therapies that we use, mostly chemotherapy-based, to try to attack the tumor from a different angle than was used before in the prior treatments. What's exciting about the field of cancer in general, but especially in terms of brain tumors, is that we're digging deeper and deeper. Uh, instead of just looking at the tumor under the microscope and making a diagnosis that way, and then formulating a treatment plan based on that diagnosis, we're now delving into the genetic level, that is, looking at the DNA and wondering, well, what makes this brain tumor of this one individual patient different from another patient's tumor? That way, we can actually get to a stage of actually customizing treatments such that one size does not fit all. Uh, if you're going to a department store to get a new suit, you would not just buy something off the rack unaltered. You're going to need some adjustments. And what we would like to be doing in the very near future is more of a customized, tailored-based approach treatment than something that's more off the rack. And the best way to do that, of course, is to better understand the tumor. And what's really exciting is that what we're learning about tumors is so much more now than it was even say 10 years ago. Here in North America and across the world there are many many fantastic institutions that you can go. Uh, Mail, what distinguishes us? Uh, I think it really is the people. We have an attitude here that I've not encountered really anywhere else. By that I mean this very simple mission statement that the needs of the patient always come first. It's very simple, it's easy to remember, it keeps our eye on the ball. And what impresses me most about here and what draws me in to here and keeps me here is that it's not just the physicians and scientists. It permeates everybody uh, that works here. And so if you're having a bad day because your patients are not doing well, there are always those around you who motivate you to, to keep up a stiff upper lip, get back in that clinic room, and do the best you can for the patients. I would say it really is this can-do attitude. Why did I choose the area of brain tumors as my specialty? Um, well, first of all, it's very heartbreaking to see patients afflicted with neurologic disorders, but I think even more so when a tumor starts to really just eat away the patient physically, little by little by little. 
Um, and you want to do something that's going to help these patients in need. And the best way to do that is to be educated in the clinical aspect, but also in the science. And as a person working at Mayo, uh, I have the opportunity and the privilege to bring forward from the scientific developments that are going on here and across the world and actually translate them into something that's meaningful to patients and families at the bedside. What then sustains me and keeps me in this profession? Well, these patients who are in their greatest time of need, they and their families, it, it, it really is amazing how they shine. They are the ones who inspire us to do a better job. They give us strength. And as I said, no matter how much the tumor may eat away the patient's physical functions, I'm always amazed at how their human spirit remains untouched. In fact, if anything, it gets stronger. So to be around wonderful people like that, uh, it, it, makes you, it makes you be inspired to strive for better things, better things for our patients, better tomorrow for our patients and families. A lot of people wonder, what's it going to be like if you come to Mayo Clinic or go to another good institution? Um, I will tell you what many patients and their families tell me and my colleagues here. They come here somewhat bewildered. It's a large place, a lot of corridors. You can get easily get lost. Fortunately, somebody will always get you to the right spot. But um, we have a team, and I think when patients come here, they sense that there's not only one doctor, but there's a huge team of doctors and scientists who are in their corner, and th they get a sense that they're not alone. Now, we have many, many smart physicians and scientists here and across the country, but what patients need there in that clinic room is a sense that they belong here, sense that we are in their corner, we will be their doctors and scientists, but also their best cheerleaders. Uh, I think that support is probably what we will provide best amongst all other places.